Welcome to Close the Gap, where we thoughtfully engage with CEOs and top industry leaders all working to close the female equity gap in the C-suite and boardroom. Christine Gannon, the CEO of Brightworks Consulting, and Dr. Antoinette Farmer-Thompson, a senior leader with Arizona State University, host insightful conversations responsible for moving the needle for female participation in the C-suite. Welcome to Close the Gap. We are so honored and thrilled to have Kathleen Duffy, the CEO of Duffy Group, with us today. Kathleen, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Good morning. So we like to start off our podcasts with um, our interviewee's bio. So we're going to take a minute and talk through Kathleen's career history and share some amazing accomplishments. And um, and so we're going to go ahead and dive in. So She um, has one of the most respected recruiting firms in the country. Kathleen's passion and dedication to help individuals find their path is matched only by her deep knowledge of the recruitment industry. She imparts the same focus and strength of purpose to her entire staff. And the result is she has one of the strongest international recruitment teams from top to bottom in the business. She has a strong commitment to serve candidates and clients alike, which motivated her to develop the recruitment research model, which enables the Duffy Group to harness marketplace intelligence, work as a discreet and transparent partner, and deliver quality candidates with up to 50% savings over traditional recruitment fees. The ability to scale and customize processes to deliver an optimal outcome, which benefits both employers and job seekers. It's a little bit more about Kathleen. She's the founding member of the Arizona Human Resource Executive Forum. She is a highly regarded keynote speaker on recruiting techniques, processes, and entrepreneurship. Most recently, she was selected as 2019 Most Admired Honoree by the Phoenix Business Journal, which is a major accomplishment. Kathleen was honored for her leadership, community service, and dedication to mentorship by being awarded the 2018 Athena Businesswoman of the Year in the private sector. Kathleen was also recognized by the Arizona Society of Human Resource Management with the Al O'Connor Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2016, 17, 18, and 19, Kathleen was an honoree of the Sun Devil 100, which celebrates the achievements of Arizona State alumni who own or lead businesses across the globe and exemplify the spirit of ASU as the new American university. Kathleen has served as the National District Coordinator for National Charity League and president of the NCL Moon Valley Chapter. In 2016, Kathleen was honored for her community service as pan Hellenic Woman of the Year, and in 2017, given the Kappa Delta Order of the Pearl, which recognizes outstanding contributions to society at the national, state, or local level outside of Kappa Delta service. Kathleen currently serves as the co-chair on 2020 Women on Boards, a national initiative to increase the percentage of qualified women on public boards. She's also the co-chair of No Longer Homeless Campaign, Cabinet, a two-phase campaign to ensure that resources are available and accessible for veterans to help end homelessness. Kathleen earned her bachelor's degree in communications from ASU. She is an avid Sun Devil, serving as the chair of the ASU Alumni Association National Board of Directors and Council, and the Board of Trustees serving on the Arizona Leadership Council. She's a member of ASU Presidents Club and the Chapter Advisory Board for Kappa Delta Sorority. Kathleen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words, too. And I can tell you, uh, Christine, with all of those things, uh, I found most amazing is her warmth. So I don't think Kathleen meets a stranger And I I wanna ask so many questions, but with all of your accomplishments, Kathleen, what is it that you are most proud of? Because you've done so much and I've watched you up close. Out of all of those things, what's meant the most to you? Wow. Um, 
You know, I think being recognized as the Athena Businesswoman of the Year probably was the icing on the cake for me. Um, you know, I'm a small business owner and um, to be recognized amongst this international um, network of women leaders uh, for, for the work that I've done as a small business owner was um, just, it was very humbling for me, but it also was, um, you know, it, it, it let me know that the work that I've been doing for the last many years um, has been recognized and respected. Absolutely. So I'm going to start off with your book because I, I think that the work you do in recruitment is what's going to really propel us towards that equity for women in the C-suite. So can you talk with us about your book and when it's coming out and your new theories and models within the book? Sure, sure. So um, my background is that I came out of, well, actually it even goes back further to my ASU days where I was involved in the, the sorority system, you heard I'm a Kappa Delta. Um, and then I was involved in another organization called Devil's Advocates. And both of those are all about recruiting new members. So you're recruiting new members to the Greek system. Um, and I was recruiting new, new students to come to Arizona State University. And, you know, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, recruiting really wasn't even human resources was what well, was called personnel at the time, wasn't a career that was, was talked about as an option. So I didn't really see that the things that I was doing was actually my passion and leading me towards this career. So I fell into a, an opportunity working for a, a boutique search firm in Phoenix. And that's really where I learned my craft. And so every retained search firm has what's called a research function. And it's the front end of the search process. And so after eight years with my uh, with the search firm, they relocated to Northern California and I found myself needing a job. And what I did is I, I introduced the option to corporate America to unbundle the search process and only buy the pieces of the process that they needed. And I changed the fee model so that traditionally, and, and even today, the fees are based on a percentage of the candidate's salary. Uh, and so I changed our model to work, be work in a billable situation. So again, because our clients are only paying for what they need, they are ending up able to save money, uh, significant money. So. After doing this for, you know, uh, January will be our 30th anniversary in business, and it's still a little known option out there. People still gravitate to the traditional models of contained and retained uh, search. And again, there's, there's nothing wrong with either of those models, but there's an, another option out there. And the purpose of the book is to elevate and help people be aware that there's a third option. And so the book will come out in October. I have three other women whose voices are in there and they own recruitment research firms too because I didn't want this to be the Kathleen Duffy story. I didn't want, you know, I really wanted it to, so that people were, it was more of an educational focus. And I have a client, my very first client who's still a client and friend today, I have her voice in there too so that she can talk about um, you know, the advantages that she's had in, in leveraging the recruitment research model. So I'm pretty excited about it. Sounds wonderful, Kathleen. That sounds like a great book. We, we would love to have you back once you've published and, and to share more information specifically related to the book. I think it could be incredibly valuable because as you said, um, a lot of times people use books and blogs and outlets like that to share information that people really don't know about. So the more we can educate, um, the broader reach that we can, we can get out to. So, so I want to ask you a question about starting your business, because I think we have a lot of women, especially during this pandemic phase that we're in right now, that are looking at pivoting. 
and they're looking at what's next for me and what's the next chapter I should write. Can you can you talk a little bit about maybe some advice you might give women who are um, maybe ready to do something different in their career or starting their own business? The first thing I tell people is don't overthink it. <laughs> I find that people get really wrapped up in, I have to have a strategic plan. I need to put this timeline together. I need to have marketing materials. I need to do this. I need to do that. And it's almost um, that they're finding excuses to not just get out there and do it. And so, um, you know, all those other things are very, very important to have. Don't get me wrong. But when you're getting, when you're just getting started, um, you're going to be there. There's not a straight path. Uh, there's all sorts of different directions that you're going to take. You know, I think about, I think about my path. Um, I didn't have a choice. I, I, I didn't have a job. Um, I was the, the primary breadwinner in my family. Uh, and, um, and so I just, I had to get out there and start talking to people. And ironically enough, I was kind of the behind the scenes person in the company that I worked for. So I really didn't have as big a network as I realized and I wasn't leveraging it. And so I thought, well, who do I know? And I went back to my ASU contacts. Um, the woman that was the, the president of, of another sorority happened to be the head of, um, uh, I guess we called it personnel for American Express at the time. And I called her up and, and I knew she'd take my call. And so you wanna find the people that'll take your call and then you start practicing your pitch, right? And Terry believed in me, she could trust me and that's how I got started. And then it, then it builds your confidence from there. So my big thing is, is just don't overthink it. And look at those people that you know, go to your, you know, they always say go to family and friends first, practice your pitch. And, um, and it'll just grow organically and be patient. Wonderful, wonderful. I completely agree. Want to talk with you about the work you're doing with women on boards. Christine and I had the uh, pleasure and honor of getting in at, on, on the end of the executive planning process of the last year. What is it that you hope for for Arizona, what are you seeing? Cause you've been in the market, you've been in the Valley, you are a connector. What is it that you would like to see happen in Arizona specifically? And what can we look forward to this year for women on boards? Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of fell into the, the leadership of 2020 Women on Boards, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you are both part of our, our leadership committee this year. Um, last year was my, my first year leading the large event, and, uh, you know, I thought it was going to kill me, um, you know, but wasn't, what doesn't kill you gets you stronger. So I'm already moving into this year, and now we have a pandemic and we have a virtual event, so now I've got something else that's new. Um, you know, for me in the Phoenix, for the for Arizona. So, I know you guys had a, um, an, a a great interview with Betsy, who is the CEO of the global um, organization. And you know, our our you know globally, we hit the goal of twenty percent of women being on corporate boards in the Russell three thousand index last year. Arizona did not reach that goal. We were just a little underneath it. And we only have, I believe, 21 companies in all of Arizona that have 20% or more of their women uh, comprised of corporate board, on their corporate board. And of those 21 companies, only three of them have women CEOs. So we do have a lot of work to do here in Arizona. And for me, you know, you, you know, Tony, you got the, you got it right. I'm a connector. And that is my ultimate goal in life is to connect these women. And so when I go out there and I'm, I'm looking for who do I want to be part of our leadership committee, it's people that have the same passion that I do. It's, it's being able to invite women to this event and help them to be able to um, start building out that network. 
because 80% of board seats are found through networking. It's not through an executive search process. And, um, you know, as Betsy said in her interview with you all, you know, it's a very confidential process. So it's not like it's posted on LinkedIn um, and you have to be able to tell your story. And I'm a, I'm all about women getting out of the office and making sure they start building that network. And it's, and it's more difficult for us because we're the primary caregivers in our households. And so, you know, we're, when we get done at work and we've got all that stuff, we come home and we've got to do it all over again with our kids, but we've, we've got to get out. And now, you know, with the uh, pandemic going on, it makes it even harder to get out there and network. So you have to force yourself to carve time out and pick up the phone and start talking to people and, and networking and staying engaged with your, with your community and letting them know that you're interested in pursuing that. Um, as part of your career. You know, studies are actually showing that um, during this pandemic, women are the ones that are impacted mo the most right now because of that, that second job, full-time job, right? In terms of caregiver, whether it's for elderly parents, children, your home, um, you know, those those things are really impacting women and impacting their careers, as well as women who are in the hospitality industry, which yeah. has been hit so hard, um, hospitality and tourism. And so I think there's an opportunity for women as they listen to this podcast to really take your advice to heart in terms of what's my next chapter? If I'm the one impacted right now, how do I pivot? And I do need to network. Maybe my network isn't to your point what I thought it would be or what I thought it was, and I need to network. So I, I'm thinking about your um, work with women on boards, and I'm wondering, as you think about Arizona and even across the country, what are some obstacles you think we face to achieving gender parity or gender balance and, and having more women on boards and, and C-suite roles? Um, you know, I think it's just that, you know, the it's becoming a bigger part of the conversation now, so I, I, you know, Arizona is 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 making progress. Um, you know, you have leaders like Bill Emilio, who's the CEO of Avnet, and he is a staunch supporter of women and has a special um, women in leadership group that where he is he is nurturing and grooming uh, his key women leaders, and he's been a huge advocate for 2020 Women on Boards and Avnet in general has been part of our um, initiative here in Arizona for several years. Um, the other one is Insight, uh, Kim Lamnick. He also is a huge proponent and his um, uh, head of, of human resources, Jen, uh, just got her first board seat because of the of her involvement on the leadership committee. And, you know, whenever I hear about board seats, I push that out to the leadership committee and also to our director coaches who volunteer to do um, coaching and mentoring of, of um, folks looking for their board seat. And she acted on it. And so she's got her first sports seat this year. And I'm so excited to, to hear that. So I think, I think we're making progress. And, um, you know, we have a search right now that we're doing with a healthcare organization. And it's for a CFO. And this is, you know, a, an over a billion dollar organization. And they want a woman in this position. And we find that more and more in the search is that they're saying we need to make sure that we um, have diversity in our slate of candidates. And that's, you know, a commitment that I, I know we do. And I would imagine most recruiting firms are doing as well. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the CFO. I want to pivot a little bit and talk about the C-suite. Because as we mentioned um, with Betsy, we had a great conversation. You really can't get the change or the acceleration of women on boards without that C-suite experience. So say, Kathleen, we put you in a room with about 20 women 
who are at the director level or senior leadership level, but not quite the C-suite. And you could tell them three things based on what you've seen. I mean, you've been in a room with CEOs, with uh, presidents of universities, with all kinds of leaders, with the governor. What would you say to them having the experiences that you have? So the first thing that I would say to them is to be very present. Um, and quite often you're, you know, you are in a room with C-level folks, it, it can be pretty intimidating. And especially if, if that room is full of very dominant personalities. And so um, it can be easy to just step back and listen and then give your voice. Um, I think you have to you have to just make sure that you have a have a voice in that room, and that you're not afraid to to share that. Um, the second thing that I would say is you need to make sure that people know the work that you're doing. And I think as women we tend to not be very braggadocious, right? Um, and we need to be able to find that fine line between. Um, you know, being braggy and just raising the awareness. And I think the third piece of it really is, is be, being able to tell your story. And, and, you know, we, I get a lot of people that call me and obviously they're looking for their, their next position or whatever it is. And they have, oh, I could do this and I could do that. And I could do, that. you have to know who your audience is and make sure that your story is understood, that it's clearly articulated and heard by that person on the C-suite so that when whatever, you know, fill in the blank opportunity comes in, that, that you are considered. And I know that whenever we do C-level searches, the first question we ask is, are there any internal candidates? And we encourage them to throw internal candidates into the mix. Because again, with our recruiting model, it not being based, our fees not being based on the candidate's compensation, we're agnostic. So we want our client to get the best person. And they may not have thought that internal candidate was ready for that C-level job. We've had that happen many, many times. And because they can look at, you know, they actually can, you know, see from a research report who the external candidates are and vet them against their internal candidate, they end up promoting their internal candidate, which is great. You brought up a really good point in terms of getting yourself known and I think, you know, women, women don't as a whole uh, do that well. I total agreement with you. But I want to spend a minute um, on that because I think that's really important. I would love for our listeners to have some advice from you on how do women do that? What is the best way for them besides being able to tell their story and their career history and some of their accomplishments? How, how do they get themselves known? I mean, you know, networking is one way, but again, that's difficult, you know, in terms of sharing your accomplishments without sounding like you solved world peace and not really wanting to come across as a know-it-all. I, I, I think, you know, that is that fine line. And I think if you have any advice that you could give our, our women listeners, um, men, men don't seem to have a difficult time with this as a whole. So this is, this is definitely a gender opportunity. Yeah, you know, um, and I think that a lot of networking happens on the golf course, right? And and so, you know, I'm, I'm not a golfer. Um, and, you know, so so how do you go into a room of people that you don't know and, and start a conversation? Um, you know, I, I would recommend that you start safely, right? So you start in environments that you know. Uh, I start, I, I go, I tell people, go right to their universities. They're, no matter where you live, so if you are a sun devil um, and you live in Maryland, 
there is an alumni chapter there. And so, you know, get involved in the alumni chapter, you know, get involved with the, 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 um, the send off of students from Maryland that are going to be coming to Arizona State University. Start with things where that you're comfortable with. Right. And then that's where you become, you know, friends and then you are becoming trusted because, again, um, you know, the last thing anybody wants is to be sold. Right. And um, and so then once you start getting to know people, then you can start asking them questions about what they do and how that relates into their space. So so for me, um, as a, you know, being, owning a recruiting firm, everybody automatically goes to the paradigm of, oh, she's going to try to get a job order from me. And, you know, that's what happens with, um, you know, we, we, we hear that in the legal space, we hear, you know, any professional services, insurance, right? Um, you're a car, a car salesperson, you know, they automatically have this paradigm of, of what you're, um, what you really want to accomplish in that conversation. So you have to figure out how do you um, ask them some questions, learn about them, and even see if it makes sense. You know, if I talk to people and I find out that they don't even hire people, then, you know, they're not going to really care that I own this great, you know, international recruiting firm. But I can learn about them and hopefully help them in some way. And that's really what it's all about, figuring out how do you help them as well. Wonderful. I think I'll throw out the last question. And it's going to be kind of different, but I, I, I think about the, the research Chris and I did uh, for Constitutional Grit, the book that, that we're putting out. And what was probably the most incredible part of it was interviewing some 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 phenomenal women, uh, a lot of them here in the valley who are executives. And so when I listen to you and think about watching you throughout the past couple of years, my question to you, because you're such a role model to so many of us, uh, and you're inspirational because like you have so much energy. I'm like, who has that much energy? <laughs> Uh, so a the question, coffee is still working right now, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I remember after the event when we saw you, you still, you could have gone another few hours and we were exhausted. <laughs> so a uh, question for you, who, who was your inspiration uh, growing up? Like who inspired you? Oh, wow. Um, you know, there's been so, so, so many people that, Cross your path, um, but I, t I, I, this is this is my story, um, and I'm sticking to it. My uh, grandmother immigrated to the United States uh, from Ireland. Uh, she was 16 years old. Classic story, you know, nothing in her pockets, and um, and, and got herself educated, and she was a nurse. Uh, she uh, got married and had six children all of whom were educated. Um, you know, my, my uncle went to Yale. As a matter of fact, he was a classmate of George Bush Sr. Um, and that was, that was a big uh, component for her. My mother is a nurse. Um, and so I just thought everybody went to college, right? Um, then my, we moved out here to uh, Arizona, and that's when I went to Arizona State University. My mother being a nurse, she got involved with the Head Start program with the migrant education and saw her changing the lives of these women, uh, migrant women who, um, you know, weren't, weren't learning how to speak English. They weren't, um, you know, she got them to volunteer in the school and then she set up a, a scholarship for migrant students. And I was at a Greater Phoenix Chamber event a few years ago. And um, one of the young girls came up to me and said, are you Nurse Gail's daughter? And I said, uh -huh. well, yes, I am. And she said, I'm Dolores's daughter. I got that scholarship from your mom. And, uh -huh. you know, and now she's a rising star at 
Salt River project. So, you know, I just saw my mom and my grandmother overcome so, so many obstacles and um, always do what was right for other people. And, um, and the, they've been, they're my role models. They, they, my guiding light. Wow. And I'm fortunate enough to have my mom live with us right now. She's 86 years old, healthy. Um, and so we're, we're really blessed to have her with us right now too. Wow. Wow. Thank you. That is awesome. What a great story. And what a great question. That is, that's fantastic. Um, I love when we make it real um, so that, that people really know there's behind all those amazing accomplishments, what the stories are, how it came together, who inspired you. So thank yeah. you, Kathleen. And thank you for being a guest on our show today. We really enjoyed our time with you and, and we want to invite you back when the book's published so we can talk more about that and, and share more education and awareness with our listeners. So thank you. Great, I'll be happy to. Thanks you guys, it's been fun. Thank you for listening. You can find more information and connect with Christine or Tony at www.tffei.org or on LinkedIn at the Foundation for Female Equity and Inclusion.